Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Shackman. Somewhere in the magic formula that makes great art is the inherent potential for pain. Someone once said that artists were like the rest of us, except that their emotions were just always sitting close to the surface, more accessible, more sensitive, and also more vulnerable to pain and despair, and even suicide. The stories of people like Kurt Cobain, Van Gogh, Virginia Woolf, Hemingway, Sylvia Plath, and Hunter Thompson, while all different, all reinforce the image and reality of the tortured artist. Add to this list Anthony Bourdain, a complicated artist in so many ways, he would suffer a similar fate. But we should also remember that while all these stories have the same ending, each artist in their journey tells us more and more about ourselves and about the human condition. That's what my guest Charles Learson does in his new biography of Anthony Bourdain, Down and Out in Paradise. Charles Learson is a former executive editor at Sports Illustrated. He's written for Rolling Stone, Esquire, and the New York Times, and has written previous biographies about Ty Cobb, the Indy 500, and Butch Cassidy. It is my pleasure to welcome Charles Learson here to talk about Down and Out in Paradise, the life of Anthony Bourdain. Charles, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, Jeff, thank you. And thank you for that very thoughtful introduction. Someone once said that we should never be defined by the worst thing that we've done or the worst thing that happened to us. Talk about how you might have thought about or written about Anthony Bourdain and writing a biography of him if his life hadn't ended in suicide. Well, I don't know that I would have written it, actually, yeah. uh, uh, because part of the the, the 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 spark for it the uh, uh, the was my curiosity which is widespread it's not unique with me in how this man who seemingly had the best job in the world and even you could say the best life in the world um, how he came to to the point where he took his own life um, so that 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 gave it a kind of a, an arc and a shape to the life and a um, a specialness in a way that that, that, that was uh, heightened my curiosity mm -hmm. and made me want to see what I could find out. I don't know if you you know if anyone's life is exactly a mystery or a jigsaw puzzle that you you, you solve and you find all the pieces for, but you can you can pull, you know you can investigate anything more. And, and I thought and I didn't see any articles back when I got this idea. I didn't see any long pieces in the New Yorker, or the New York Times about what exactly had happened to Anthony Bourdain. And so uh, as a journalist, I had the, the privilege of trying to step in and, and supply those, that, 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 that journalism myself. One of the things about him and in, in, in you writing about him is that while he was certainly tortured in, in many respects and certainly angry at, at various points in his life, that he wasn't what one would consider to be clinically depressed. There weren't those clear signs that led to, to his suicide. That's true. I mean, I've, depression is a very insidious thing and a very, um, you know, difficult to diagnose, certainly if you're not uh, qualified to diagnose it. And I'm not. I'm not a doctor. Uh, but, uh, but I did find that uh, both of his wives... Uh, had said uh, said that he was not depressed. That he was, you know, these are people that were obviously pretty close to him. That he was, you know, he had a kind of a skeptical air about him, and he he was always going for the joke. And his his demeanor as a as a comedian, if you will, was was the dour skeptic. Uh, and and so that that could be mistaken a lot of times for depression. But people told me when I asked that question to a lot of people, a lot of old friends and all, they, they, they seemed to perk up and they liked the chance to answer this because it had been something that been on, had been on their mind that people were just writing him off as a depressive. But they said all his life he was very prone to be very excited about, about a new movie or a new book uh, that he'd read um, and a new piece of music that he'd heard. And uh, he was very upbeat a lot of the time. Of course, he was also a lifelong, just about a lifelong drinker. Uh, so that that can that, that's a factor in the other direction. So uh, you know, brackish water, half salty and half uh, fresh. Uh, you know, that might define him in a way. One wonders, and and again, we're not 
psychiatrist that it's hard to to diagnose from afar at best. But there there was a certain sense of maybe manic quality and that that so much of the alcohol was kind of a self-medication for all of it. It may have been. He was certainly... uh... He was certainly the sort, of, and a lot of people pointed this out, and there was a lot of evidence of it, who when he when he got interested in something was all in on it. And uh, when he was a kid, he, he, he developed an interest in comic books and comic book art, and he wound up being a pretty serious collector of rare comic books. Uh, and he got interested in, in high school or college and, and uh, the, the JFK assassination, and he could... He, soon be able to clear a room talking about Jack Ruby and his theories. You know, he was, he was, he was all in on everything. And when he got into, uh, when he first got into cooking, he was all in on that. And then, then he was all in on, on various uh, relationships he had with, with women, including unfortunately his, his final one that he couldn't, uh, he, he just couldn't have one foot in, in, in reality or one foot in a solid place. Sometimes he had to have both feet in, in what he was passionate about at the moment. As you talk about it, he seemed consistent throughout his life in those respects. Were there ways in his life that he changed over the years? Well, that's a good question. He was, I did find him to be remarkably consistent, although he was also a man and, you know, his contradictions were, were consistent. Um, I, I, I don't know if I'd say that he changed, but he lost track of himself. I think he, you know, he had this odd history in that he became a celebrity and became famous at the age of 43 or 44. Suddenly he was a celebrity and he was a mature man at that point, And he very consciously vowed that he would never, uh, he would never become a jerk. He would never like, like so many show business types are and so many celebrities and that he would always keep in perspective that he didn't exist to be on television because he hadn't been on television for the first 44 years of his life. And, you know, and he survived that, but he did lose track of that, especially in the last two years of his life. And he started to be abusive or, or got more abusive to the people around him who he worked with. Uh, and, and, and he started to forget who he was, I think. Until he had, I think, a rather uh, sudden realization or a little flash of, of how far he'd come from the man he wanted to be in his last few days. And I think that that led to his despair and the despair led to his taking his own life. You talk a lot about his the comments that he made, particularly near the end, about really hating being famous. Yeah, he said that. He's, that, that was another counter to the question of being depressed and all because he for most of his life he 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 kind of enjoyed being famous as i note in the book he had a a a a push notification on his phone that every time he was mentioned anywhere on the internet his phone would ping and uh he'd look he'd look at it wherever he was and people who said he drove them crazy he was sitting next to him at a bar or in a restaurant and if the phone didn't ping for a while and a half hour an hour he got jumpy and he started, he would might start a feud on the Twitter with, uh, you know, criticizing some chef or some chef's TV show just to stir things up. So he, he you know, he liked that. And, uh, and he was very gracious to people who, who approached him and came up to him as long as, you know, maybe he wasn't in the middle of a meal in a restaurant or they weren't too obnoxious about it. But as Part of the Anthony Bourdain story is a, is a simple story of exhaustion, of a man wearing himself to a frazzle and wearing himself out. He, he was on the road 250 days a year, year after year. You know, he was he, he helped us romanticize travel, but travel is is not all all pleasant. It's, uh, things always go wrong. And even when they don't go wrong, it's a very wearing and uh, fatiguing experience. So he was traveling for 250 days a year, and he was drinking huge amounts of alcohol at the end, which is a drug that will tire you out even even more. So he got to that point. Part of that story with Anthony Bourdain is simply wearing himself out and getting to a point where he didn't think he could untangle the knot that his 
his life had become. There's also the sense of him being such an addictive personality. I mean, as you said earlier, whatever he did, he was all in. He was addicted to it. He became addicted to travel, to the alcohol, ultimately addicted to Asia Argento. I mean, there was th- this addictive quality seemed to drive him in so many ways. Yes, it did. Unfortunately, you know, he, he got involved in in uh, heroin and uh, cocaine and crack uh, initially uh, because he he kind of, as, as he admitted, he kind of liked the idea, the romantic idea of being a junkie and uh, that he'd read in William Burroughs books, of, you know, about it. And, and, and he wanted to be that authentic guy. He, he strove for authenticity his whole life. He, he somehow told himself because he was a guy from New Jersey, a New Jersey suburb, that he couldn't be authentic. But, of course, everybody, all these artists that we know, they all came from somewhere. And very few of them came from the Lower East Side of Manhattan, some gritty place that you might say is authentic. But, you know, what does that mean anyway, authentic? So he, he always strove for this authenticity, and it led, that led him into drugs, and he became addicted. And you're right, he, 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 he wrote about I, I had... I got access to papers that he wrote in college in which he, he talked about his, his, his addiction, if you will, to, to, to dramatic women. And this was when he was 20 years old in college, and he's writing about specific incidents of uh, dramatic women. And I, I point out that he would always be sort of addicted to dramatic women, and especially at the end that his, his, uh, his last lover was... Uh, 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 something of a drama queen as opposed to being an actual professional actress. So uh, he was consistent in that way. And what was it about her that created so much pain for him? Well, I think when you come down to it, and I say in the book a couple of times that he was a Jersey boy, and uh, uh, his brother has criticized me publicly for saying that, said, oh, he was a sophisticated man, a traveler, world traveler. Yes, of course he was. He was sophisticated and he was a world traveler but he was also a jersey boy in the sense that we all are even even those of us who aren't boys uh that that he that some basic things uh matter to him such as such as your girlfriend pulling away from you or your girlfriend cheating on you or your significant other uh do, doing those doing those things he 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 got to the point he was all in on Asia argento and decided that she had to, she was the woman for him the only woman he said in one of his texts you know who could who could make me happy which is a, a you know a false idea but it's an idea that we all play with in our mind when we're passionate about about someone and he got the idea somehow that there were no um alternatives to this and uh, and it, and as she pulled away you know basically it, it it's been said by many people, that life is like high school, and I think it is. And I think in this case, in Bourdain's case, it very much he was he was the boy who wanted to go steady, and she was the girl who, after a time, didn't want to go steady and was pulling away. And the more she pulled away, the more desperate he got. And even though he knew that his desperation was was turning her off and pushing her away further, so he was caught in this horrible cycle of thinking he had to have this thing that that he was in, he was involved in pushing away himself. It was a horrible place to be because he convinced himself that that was the reality and there were no alternatives to that. Talk about how he convinced himself of that. I mean, it, it, I mean, yes, life is like high school, but at this point he's, what, a 61-year-old man with a lot of experience in the world. Yeah, that's true. But I think, it, he was, you know, if we can learn anything from his life, it's that uh, sometimes experience, you know, doesn't matter. And he, and he, and he was this all in passionate person. It's, it's part of what made him extraordinarily successful and, and, and great. You know, he, he, he stumbled into the, he wrote a book. He thought of himself as a writer. He thought of himself as a fiction writer. That didn't pan out too well. He wound up in, in he, he kind of stumbled into nonfiction writing this memoir of the restaurant business. It was a tremendous success. And that turned into a TV show, which he'd never planned on. But he got fascinated by TV and the idea of of, of perfecting this travel show, which is, I, I note in the book, it, it's not a slam dunk. You, you'd think like sending a, prof- a crew of professional film people to some beautiful exotic location would guarantee a show that everyone would want to watch. But it's, it's kind of it's kind of not not the case. It's 
it's more like, you know, sitting next to a stranger at an airport bar and they start showing you their vacation pictures. No one really wants to see another person's uh, uh, travel pictures. But Bourdain somehow got over that hump and he, 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 he made that a fascinating experience. And then he perfected that idea. Him and his crew uh, over the course of 17 years perfected that idea. And uh, as I also say in the book, it was like watching the Beatles go from album to album and get deeper and more complicated and 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 better somehow uh and and watching them do this and so he and the crew had this tremendous experience together of uh they missed their children's birthdays back at home because they were on the road 250 days a year and they missed all kinds of you know holidays and and whatnot and but they 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 be, they bonded and they over this idea of creating this wonderful brand of TV that really hadn't existed before the like the the, the the highly successful travel show. There's no really precedent for it. Um, so there's another case of him getting passionate and getting bound up in that, and then and then really taking that too far, getting getting to the point where no one could do it as well as he could, and and then being abusive to the to the people around him who had helped him get where he was. One of the things. That, that seems to run throughout, and, and you touch on it a few times, this notion that he romanticized things, whether it was drugs and alcohol or whether it was ultimately Argento or, or whatever, that he romanticized things to, to the extreme, which is what made him so successful in his writing and his cooking and everything that he did, but it's also what brought him down. That's true. I mean, in his earliest days, we see uh, I was able to, uh, talked to a lot of old friends and family members who remembered his household and the household uh, dynamic there. And and he, as soon as he got old enough to be conscious of such things, he became disappointed in in life because his parents weren't getting along, and it seemed like his his mother was sort of bullying his father uh, for not you know ha- having enough of an income, not being ambitious enough, uh, and and. And, and Bourdain, uh, he, he sided with his father very openly in the family, where the brother sided, his one brother, his one sibling sided with his mother. And, and he said that then and later that it, this wasn't the way it was supposed to be with parents fighting. It was supposed to be, you know, he grew up in the 50s, so maybe he had this idea of, of these Ozzy and Harriet households. And, and uh, it wasn't supposed to be this way. But who told him that? He just had this notion of, of a romantic life, of a, of a life that was supposed to be pleasant and nice, and, 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 and your mother got along with your father and, and vice versa. And, all. and when it didn't work out that way, he didn't know what to do about it. He became very disappointed, and that became a driving thing in his life, that household dynamic, his whole life. He, towards the end, he, he very much disliked his mother. I think on some level he, he still loved her, but he did cut her out of his will and, and stopped talking to her uh, for all practical purposes and and uh, the last few, couple of years of his life because he resented what she'd done to his father and what that meant to him was that life wasn't perfect. His romantic notion of life had been shattered by his mother. And talk about his relationship with his first wife, which was kind of an anchor for him. Yeah, that was a very long relationship. It's very interesting. It's what I talk about about contradictions in your life because it was a very long relationship that lasted uh it started in high school and um and 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 ended uh when he became famous at the, when he was uh, in his mid entering his mid 40s uh nancy Potowski uh and was her name and and she was the, the daughter of a well-to-do doctor in leonia she was a uh a year older than he was and she had been dating the kind of the big man on campus in their their uh, very uh, ritzy private school that they all went to. And one day, she suddenly the the gossip on the on the campus was that the Nancy had uh, had switched uh, boyfriends, and now it was uh, Tony Bourdain who was uh, her boyfriend. And and that relationship endured, and they got on and off heroin together. And, um, and 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 endured. The only thing it couldn't survive was his fame, because Nancy was very set against it. She knew from the start that she didn't want to be 
involved in this kind of life where she was expected to give interviews and be public and be the wife of a celebrity. Uh, she didn't even want to travel that much. You know, before Bourdain became famous, he, he, he was he was very much a below average traveler in terms of he'd been to the Caribbean a few times because Nancy liked to go there. It didn't really matter what country she went to. She just wanted to go to get some sunshine every every winter uh, for a week or so. And he'd been to France a couple of times with his parents because uh, his father was French and they had some family over there as a, as a young man, he'd been there. But apart from that, Bourdain hadn't traveled anywhere. And, and she became this uh, restriction on him, this, this sort of anchor that was, it was, she wasn't going to, she wasn't going to go along with this. The, the, the fame was sweeping him up rather suddenly and dramatically, and she wasn't going to go along with it. And the contradiction is really that they broke up and that he never, he never, he, he broke up cleanly with her and never kind of went back to her, her orbit again. Whereas with his, his second wife, Octavia, he never wanted to get divorced from her. And that was part of the typical thing because he didn't want to put his daughter through a divorce, uh, their daughter through a divorce, which, <laughs> which is kind of ironic in a way because he put her through this very public uh, relationship he had with a woman who, who wasn't her mother. Um, and, um, but, but that's, that's, that, that's the way he thought. Did Nancy, his first wife, have a sense of what fame would do to him? Well, I don't know about that, but she just, she just knew, I, I, I talked to her on a limited basis uh, for this book and she, I, I got the sense that she just knew from, from not only from my conversations with her, but from, from his writing about her, she just knew that it wasn't what she wanted. You know, it's what a lot of people would want, uh, but she had this very clear idea that it was it wasn't what what she wanted, and and he he quickly he got that idea. You know, again, it was his his fame was very sudden and very dramatic, and this this problem in their relationship was suddenly laid bare uh, by by the fact that he's literally almost swept up and taken around the world. Uh, you know, by by his fame. You know, a lot of people become famous and they become rich. Elon Musk is in the news lately. Of course, Donald Trump, other politicians. They have money, they have fame, but they don't have the love that Bourdain had. Bourdain had all those things, and he had the love of millions of people around the world. And um, that's what was both uh, a miracle to him in a good sense and also became later in life, a, a huge burden, all that love. Talk about the ways in which it was a burden. How did he feel it as a burden? Well, I think he, 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 he I, I think his, his, the fact that it, it comes down to this simple thing of fatigue for Bourdain, it, it's not a very uh, glamorous answer to what, what happened to Anthony Bourdain, but a lot of it uh, can be attributed to fatigue, emotional fatigue, mental fatigue, spiritual fatigue, uh, physical fatigue. Uh, again, the traveling over, over the course of all these years, it was wearing him down and he couldn't, he couldn't bring himself to pull away from the show because, because of what I mentioned before, because of the love he realized he, He'd encountered this love, this ocean of love, had had come his way at, uh, at the again at the age of forty four, and if he if he pulled it was such a, a weird and wonderful thing in a way, that, but if he pulled away from it, he might never be able to get it back, and so as as tired as he was, and he was financially set for life, he still couldn't pull away from it because he a friend of his told me that he'd be in a bar with him having a beer and they'd be talking seriously about Bourdain quitting. And then some random person in the bar would come up and say, you know, I never traveled in my life, but because of your show, I got a passport for the first time in my life at the age of 50. And I'm now I'm going to see my son who's a, who backpacks all over Australia. And, and thank you for doing that. And Bourdain would hear one random story like that. And he'd sign up for another 250 uh, days on the road, another year uh, with the show, and he and and so he became he became physically uh, you know worn down by that. A lot of understanding, and and then the alcohol, as I say, drenching himself in alcohol. Apart from that, if you try to understand Anthony Bourdain, then 
that's that simple matter of exhaustion and fatigue is, is important and maybe more important than depression even. Was there anybody that could talk straight to him? Uh, yeah, I think his wife, Otavia, they developed this very unusual relationship. They had been very uh, passionate, very, you know, normally man and wife uh, when, when they got together. They had a child together. He wanted to have a child with her. Um, and But then the, the, the usual mundane thing happened as he got, as, as the child got too old to travel with them for a while. They tried to go all over the place as a trio, but, but they, um, they couldn't do that uh, as, 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 as Ariane, his daughter, needed to be in school and whatnot. So he would be off. And he'd be off for a long time. And, you know, we've heard the story before with celebrities, whether they're athletes or actors or uh, politicians. The separation is deadly to a relationship uh, very often. And, and in this case, it was. And their relationship evolved into something that was a, a true friendship. Uh, and at, at the end, uh, Tavia was speaking to him pretty much on a daily basis. And he was going through a lot. And he, he, he turned to her as a counselor. And she could, she could say the truth to him and talk sense to him, and he could acknowledge it. He, if you look at the text and uh, and emails that are in the book, he says, "I know, I know. You know, I'm, this is this is crazy. I'm I'm being you know, I'm being uh, I'm I'm going to I'm set up. I'm going to be you know. I want to use the language that he used. But I'm, eventually, I'm going to be done in by the, by this, and I know it, but I can't stop myself. So even sometimes when he heard the right advice." He couldn't stop himself, and, and that was part of being in a horrible position that he was in. Talk about all the controversy that surrounds those final 48 hours. You've gotten caught up in it as a result of what you've written in the book. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it was a, it was a, it was a time when, you know, I, I, he, they were in, in uh, Alsace, France, in a, t- in a town called Kaisersburg, which is a beautiful kind of Hansel and Gretel town, you know, not far from the German border. It's that part of France that has a lot of German influence in it. It was a, it was a beautiful area. But, and uh, his friend, Eric Repair, was one of those shows, the, the great chef Eric Repair was with him, and uh, he was often a sidekick and appeared on Bourdain shows. But I think Repair and the whole crew could see, could see things getting even worse. They, they were, but by that point, they were used to him going off and having fights on the phone with uh, Ozzy, uh, disagreements about about things, and he was he was trying to get her work on the show as a as a star and also as a, di- a guest star and also as a director, and she would be uh, talking about pulling out at the last minute, and that was really uh, would have been disastrous to each show because their schedule was so tight, and they would one one week they'd be in one city and another week they'd be on a whole different continent and and she had this leverage of, of like saying well i don't know if i really want to do this and it was it was uh and was making him feel foolish because he he was pushing for her to be on the show and the cast and crew and the producers were, were were making it clear they were against it but they couldn't stand in his way he was such a, a star and a big shot at that point and so if she pulled out and the whole house of cards that was the schedule came tumbling down uh, they wouldn't, you know, it would be clear who had done that. So he, he felt, he felt a lot of pressure on that. And he was having, he was having, uh, in his last few days, he was having, uh, especially intense arguments with her and, and, uh, and, and he was being, he was especially in a state of fatigue. And then she showed up in the, on the paparazzi pages, uh, cavorting, you might say with this young French journalist in Rome at a hotel where she and Bourdain had spent some particularly romantic times and had good memories of. And, and, and that was a punch in the gut to him on top of, of everything else. As I say, it's that Jersey boy thing. It doesn't matter how many countries you've been in, how sophisticated you are. That hurts when you're, when, when, when you're uh, and uh, beloved, uh, you see her or he or she, he or she cheating on you. And, uh, so it, it, it hurt him like a punch in the gut, and they got she got back on the phone, and they had fights about that. He was trying to clarify. They had agreed that they could both see other people, and he'd agreed to that, but he had certain conditions. He was trying to find a way to justify his feelings, I think. He just felt 
bad because she cheated on him. And then he had this moment where they went for a, uh, he, he ran into, or didn't run into, he knew the guy was there, a chef that he'd known 15 years before in uh, New York who had a two-star Michelin restaurant right in the, in the next town over from where he was. He went to dinner there with him, an old friend. And then they, uh, John Paul Schillinger, the man's name is, and he said, let's go for a beer run across the German border after their meal. And they went. And when they went into this German pub, uh, everyone recognized Bourdain when he came through the door and they shouted and they toasted him. And Bourdain just had a marvelous time. And this was two nights before he died. And but I think that helped him see how how life had been and and, and, and how far he'd come uh, getting himself into a miserable position with this with this woman he was in. He was not only he was paying he was supporting her financially when when it turned out that she had been accused of sexually abusing a 17 year old actor that she'd worked with. He paid off the actor $380,000 to go away. And then he hired a private detective to follow the actor so they could get the kid, uh, so they could get dirt on him, which they could use against him so he couldn't speak up again in the future. It was an ugly mess uh, that Bourdain found him in, himself in, exactly the kind of horrible show business, disastrous mess that he, he vowed he'd never get involved in. And I think between being in that mess and seeing how things were in the good old days when he went on that beer run with his friend, the, the contrast between those things struck him, and he no longer felt he had the energy to, to, to resolve those things, to get out of one situation and get back to another better one. He didn't have the physical and emotional energy to do that anymore. Charles Learson, the book is Down and Out in Paradise, The Life of Anthony Bourdain. Charles, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Sure, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.